Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate that song, and I hope that you could say this morning that you are washed in the blood. A couple of you can. That's good to know. I can say I'm burning in the sun. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're washed in the blood, you'll never have to burn for eternity. All right. Uh, take your Bibles this morning. Turn to Acts chapter number 3. chapter 3 this morning. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I know it's hot, and I'm going to do my absolute best to get y'all out of here before 3 o'clock this afternoon, okay? Woo! All right, I know people are excited. No, uh, I'm going to say this right quick, and uh, just to let you know, keep looking on Facebook this afternoon. I'm going to put an announcement on Facebook via video, uh, and on uh, our prayer chain that we have, I'm going to put an announcement up there about some good news. And let me let you know what the good news is. The good news is on June the 7th, Grace Baptist Church is going to be open back up. Yeah. All right? Now, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a federal court judge that had enough common sense and decency to read and understand and know what the Constitution of this country says, that we have the right and freedom to religious liberty to worship anywhere in any way we please. Yeah. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the president standing up and saying this week that churches are essential. Yeah. Places of worship are essential. Now, we already knew that, right? Yeah. But some people forgot about that. And it's bad the way that some of the things happen in this country. People getting arrested at church, getting fined at church for uh, being just worshiping. But anyways, I'm thankful for those things. And rather than taking up time to explain all that to you right now, I'm going to wait and do it in the video. And you can watch the video. You can share the video. But mark your calendars. June the 7th, we will open back up, all right? Unless Jesus comes back, in which case everybody's going to be opened up, all right? Okay. June the, or Acts chapter 3 this morning. All right, I'm going to say something, church, and I want you to repeat after me. It's a very simple phrase. And I want you to repeat after me. Everybody say with me. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Y'all said it, but I don't believe that you believe it. Let's say it again. There is power in the name of Jesus. There we go. That's more like it. All right. Now, that's a very simple phrase this morning. But you know something? The early church, they knew that. And they believed that. They understood that there really is power in the name of Jesus. Now, we're going to look in Acts chapter 3 in just a minute, but I want to say a couple of words. I want to uh, lay the background, if you will. Acts chapter 3, give me one second here. I'm going to turn up uh, my brightness here so I can read this. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John... Peter and John are going to prove this very fact to us that there is power in the name of Jesus. You see, these men were convinced that there's power in the name of Jesus because of personal experience. They had seen Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They had felt Jesus' presence. And they believed, they had seen Jesus, rather, they had seen Jesus heal people, seen Him walk on water, feed the thousands. They had seen Him die and be buried. And then they had seen Him rise again. And they believed that there was power in the name of Jesus. So we see Peter and John going to the temple. In just a minute, I'll talk about that. Uh, and then we see at the beautiful gate, when they come into the temple at the beautiful gate, we see a poor beggar, a crippled man, a man who had never walked, a man who was lame from his burden, a man who had lived his entire life as a burden to other people. He had been a burden to his parents, not that it was a burden to have a special needs child, but a burden in the fact that this man could do nothing for himself. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't dress himself, couldn't walk. Couldn't, if he was hungry, he couldn't get up and go and fix himself a sandwich the way that, you know, we talk uh, today, and, and if we were talking in, a, in an hour time period, he couldn't do those things. He had to be carried. He had to be cared for. And he was a burden to his family and to his friends because someone every day had to bring him to the temple, to the beautiful gate, and sit him outside the gate so that he could beg some religious person for money. Now, I didn't... I, I chose those words intentionally. A religious person. He's asking money from a religious person as possible. Uh, the people, as they would come into the temple to worship and to pray and to praise the Lord, as they would come in, he would be sitting there and he would say, do you have any change that you can spare for someone who's in need, a fellow Jew, a fellow Israelite? Do you have some change that you can spare? And on the way into the temple... These people would be sure, no problem, let me see what I've got. And they would pull out their wallet and they would pull out 
probably more money than they would if they were given on the way out. And they uh, would come in, or going in, they would reach down and they would give him money. And here's the reason that they would give him money, because they are thinking in their heads, God, you see me giving this man some money. This ought to prove to you, God, how much I love you. And prove to you, Lord, that I'm a good person. And prove to you, God, that I deserve your blessings. Now, the problem with that is they were spiritually blind because that's not how God operates. That's not how God works. And so they would give to this man money thinking, hoping that it would earn some favor with God. But that is not how it works, okay? Uh, my friends, God was about to use Peter and John to do something in, uh, miraculous. They were about to turn the courtyard into a courtroom. Alright? Uh, I want you to read the opening verses. I want to read these first few verses here. We'll just start reading. Uh, chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Can I just say something that's interesting? The ninth hour, the hour of prayer. This is also the same, the same time that Jesus would have finished His work on the cross. He would have said it is finished and would have given up the ghost just a few weeks earlier. And so they were going down to the altar whenever Jesus, at the same time that Jesus would have given up the ghost. So that's pretty interesting. I'm sorry, to the temple, not the altar. Uh, so they went about the ninth hour, being the, the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the, at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, and look, he said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Boy, he got something, didn't he? He received something from them, but it's not what he wanted. Look at verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. As I was, as I was studying this, I came across an illustration. And I can't remember the names. You'll have to forgive me. But there was a Christian leader in the early church. Um or at one point in church history, who was a very godly man who visited Rome and visited the Pope. He gave access into the, uh, visiting the Pope. And he walks in, and there sits the Pope. And the Pope is counting the money that has been brought in. And there's piles and piles of gold and silver, and it's stacked up everywhere. And the Pope looks at this man, and he says, Brother so-and-so, the church can no longer say, Silver and gold have I none. And without missing a beat, the man looked at the Pope and he said, That's true, but the church can never, cannot also, also cannot say anymore, In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. See, at some point, the church had lost its power. The church began to put its faith in gold and silver, and we lost sight of where our power really comes from, which is from Jesus Christ and through Him. All right, but I want to bring this message this morning because I want to tell you that there is still power in the name of Jesus today. There is still power in the name of Jesus. The question is this. Is the power of Jesus' name at work within you? Do other people see Him working in you, in your life as an individual? Do they see that? That's what I want to look at this morning. But let's pray together. Lord in heaven, I thank you for everyone that's coming out. Lord, I thank you for this breeze that's coming through here right now. That feels good on me. Lord, I want to ask, dear God, that you would please uh, bless our time together and help us, Lord, as we look at your word. Help us, Lord, just to get it into our hearts and help us to apply our lives to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to consider, I want you rather to consider the following ways in which the power in Jesus' name is still at work today. I want to use what happened in the past in Acts chapter 3 to look at or to show you, to demonstrate that, the power, that there is still power in the name of Jesus today. I want you to notice, first of all, the man. Notice the man, okay? Verses 1 through 8. We just read those. We stopped off at verse number um, 6, where uh, Peter says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he says, He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, and he, he, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now that's great. That's a miracle right there. That's something that God did. Okay, now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. 
But I want to say a couple things about the man. First of all, the beggar was real and he had a real need. He needed to be healed if he was going to walk. He needed that if he was going to be able to walk again. But he is also a representative of humanity. This man represents a very real need that you and I have. This man represents a very real need that everybody has. Our neighbors that aren't here this morning, but no doubt some of them can hear us, um, they have this very real need. I want you to understand something about this, and I want to make an application, some connections to this man, and I want to show you this real need. First of all, we are all unable to stand before God. This man couldn't stand, period. You and I, we're unable to stand before God. So when Peter and John come on the scene, he sees them as an opportunity to meet some of a physical need, a monetary need, a financial need. And instead of that, they say, listen, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto you. Uh, we are unable to stand before God. We are spiritual cripples at our birth. You understand that whenever Adam fell in the garden, we fell with him. Whenever he sinned, his sin came upon all of his seed. And because we are the seed of Adam, we all inherited a sinful nature. Therefore, we are all crippled before God. Not only can we all, are we all unable to stand before God, but we are all separated from God at birth. Look at verse number 2. It says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the, gate, uh, at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that would enter into the temple. Did you notice? They put him outside the temple, not inside the temple. He was outside the temple. You and I are a lot like that. We are unable or we are separated from God at birth. Because of the birth defect that this man had, he couldn't go into the temple. He wouldn't be allowed in there to worship. He, was, he had to be placed outside the temple. His lameness not only kept him from standing, but his lameness also kept him separated. You know what? Our sin, our sinful nature, acts in the same exact way. It separates us from God. It keeps us from being able to stand before Him. Now the Bible says, says rightly, that there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ is God, to the, or Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His lameness kept him from standing and it kept him separated. Our sin keeps us separated from God as well. It keeps us outside of the presence of God. No matter how hard you work, no matter how many good things you do, no matter how faithful you are to come into church, no matter how, uh, how much you do, how many jobs or offices you hold inside the church, if you are separated from God, but you are separated from God by your sin nature, and if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, guess what? You will be separated from God for all eternity at your death because God is holy. So we understand that this morning, alright? I'm going to go on here. Uh, not only was he unable to stand before God, not only was he separated from God, not only are we unable to stand before God, not only are we unable or separated from God, but guess what? We are all poor and unable to repay God for what he's done for us. This man was poor. He was asking of alms. This man, he was, uh, he was poor to the point that he didn't have any money to pay for a doctor's care. Not that a doctor could have done anything for him in his day. You know, doctors still to this day, and with all of our advancements in medicine and technology, if you're a cripple, you're still a cripple. They can maybe make your life a little bit better. They can maybe do procedures and stuff to give you a little bit of a, a, a better quality of life. But they can't cure you from that. You know, for all of our medical procedures and everything, people are starting to live longer than they've ever lived before. But people still die. We still die. We can't stop death. You wonder why? I'll tell you why. Because God says it's appointed and a man wants to die and after this the judgment. Because of Adam's sin, we are all going to die. We are unable to pay, uh, repay God for what he's done. This guy here, this lame man, didn't even have the money to pay for his next meal. He was simply poor. We're the same way, by the way, because of our sinful condition. We are, no matter how much we work, we can never pay off the great debt that God paid for us or the great debt that we owe. We can never repay God for that. Uh, but I want you to notice, lastly, uh, that we all stand in need of God's grace. If you look at verses 3 through 7, we've already read those. I won't read them again. I do want to point out this. In verse number 4, the Bible says, Peter fastening his eyes upon him. That word fastening is interesting. It means that he, his eyes, whenever he looks at the cripple, he, he locks eyes with him and he looks on him. And you know what he sees? A poor crippled man. 
No. He looks beyond that. He gets beyond the outward appearance of this man and gets right down into the greatest need that he has. He looks into the very soul of this man. He sees a lost person that is poorer than he realizes. He sees a lost person that is more crippled than he even knows. He sees a lost person who stands in need of the grace of God Almighty. He sees a lost person that he knows Jesus Christ died for. And so Peter looks on him and he sees those things. I want you to notice words. Uh, his words first bring heartache. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. This man asked for money. He said, I need something to, I need money to buy something to fill my stomach with. I need money to buy maybe a better pillow, a better bedroll, something where I could be more comfortable here while I'm begging for people, begging money from people. Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any money. You ever had somebody ask you for something and it's a legitimate need and you say, I don't have any money. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I don't have any money. I've done that before several times. More times, I promise you this, I have had to turn people away more times than I've had money to give them. But you know what we have? You ever tried this? I don't have any money to give you, but would you mind if I prayed with you right now? We don't think about that, do we? We just think, well, they need money. I don't have money. I can't help them. But Peter says, I don't have any money. But here's what I do have. I have a relationship with the Savior. I have a relationship with the great physician. I have a relationship with the God of heaven that loves you, that died for you, so that you can be in heaven with Him. He says, listen, buddy, you think you've got physical needs. Let me tell you about your greatest need. It's your spiritual need right here. Those words, the next words bring healing. He says, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's all he says. And then he reaches down and grabs that man's hand and pulls him up. Could you imagine being that crippled man? Now, he had to have felt different when Peter said those words. He had to have felt different whenever Peter reached down and grabbed him. He had to have felt the healing power of God on him because when Peter pulled him up, it says immediately. Not gradually. Not over time. Doesn't say that he got stronger over a period of time. The Bible says immediately he was healed and he stood up and he leaped and stood up and praised the Lord. Okay? Let me tell you, whenever God does something, you're going to praise Him for it. Uh, Peter had no money, but Peter had Jesus. And Peter was able to look beyond the outward needs of this man and see the greatest need of all. He needed healing, yes, but to do this, uh, but not, excuse me, he needed healing, but not from his lameness. He needed healing from his lost condition. Let me tell you, when the Bible says in Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed, that doesn't mean that we get to pray and Jesus is going to heal our every malady. That means by his stripes we are healed from the one thing that we all suffer from, and that is our sinful condition. And when Jesus was beaten and scourged, he was beaten because we deserve that beating. When he was hung on the cross and he died, he died because we deserve that death. Alright? That's what the Bible means when it says that. Not that we can pray and Jesus is going to miraculously heal us every single time. Now that's His business if He chooses to do that. But the Bible says that we are healed by His stripes. We are healed from our lost condition. We see Peter reaching down in the name of Jesus. We see the beggar reaching up in faith. Grabbing hold of Peter's hand. We see this formerly lame man leaking hands, but through it all, we see Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. You notice Peter didn't say, Hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give thee. In the name of Peter of Galilee, rise up and walk! That man would still be lame to this day. But he said, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The crippledness of this man had no power over the name of Jesus because Jesus is all-powerful, all right? So we see the man. Next, I want to see the multitude. The multitude. Look here in verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> and all the people saw him walking and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And look at verse number 10. And they knew it was he which sat at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. You know what they didn't say? This guy's a con artist. He's a con artist. Peter and John, they're con artists. They paid this man to come in with these fake crutches and this fake crippleness. And he got up and he wasn't really crippled. He was just playing. No, 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 no. They knew this man was crippled. They knew this man from his birth. They could look. This tells me that there was something about him. His feet, his legs looked different. 
Maybe they were, they were bone thin because of atrophy. He had never used them before, so he had no muscle tone. But all of a sudden, they reach, Peter reaches down, calls on Jesus' name, and this man stands up and walks. He is a different man. All right, they knew it was him that sat, and be, uh, sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in this porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. I want to point out, as I look at this, and I think about the early church, and I think about the church today, I think about how the ministry-mindedness of the church has ended. I'm sorry, that's the wrong phrase. How the ministry mindedness of the church has changed. And it has changed, hasn't it? You see, the early church focused on the individual. Did you notice that Peter walked in? He saw the crowd. He saw the multitude. But he saw this one man who had a need. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't do a lot of good against everybody in the city of Greensboro. If we could fit the entire city of Greensboro in this parking lot, first of all, it would be pretty crowded, right? But if we could, if I could go somewhere, maybe to the Coliseum, and get just a fraction of the people in the city of Greensboro, I could preach the same message and reach maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen people. But you know what? That's not what God is saying here. That's not what we're getting here. The early church, you know, Peter walked in the temple and he saw all those people there, all those devout Jews worshiping and praying to God. But he didn't focus on them. He focused on the one person. See, the early church used to focus on the individual, okay? And the multitude would come second. Today, the focus is backwards. We focus on the multitude. What can we do to get more people in our church? What can we do to get our numbers to increase? What can we do to increase our giving? What can we do to, uh, to, to uh, focus or to, uh, to uh, uh, get our church to grow? We look at growth. And we always think of numbers. Now listen, that's a part of growth. You cannot argue that numbers is not a part of growth. But you know what God is pleased with? Spiritual growth of His children, number one. Spiritual growth of His children, number one. But the early church focused on the individual. We look at church, we look at the multitude, and we want to go after the multitude. And we're not successful, and we wonder why. Well, it's because to reach the multitude, we've got to reach one person. We've got to reach one of them at a time. Am I right? Got to reach them one at a time. Some people say, you know, what changes need to be made in the church? Well, sometimes there's room for changes. Amen. This ain't 1950 anymore. This is 2020. There ought to be some changes that have taken place in the church from 1950 until 2020. And there have been. Uh, there should be a marked difference. Uh, and what I'm saying is this. There should be a difference between Grace Baptist Church today and Grace Baptist Church in 1950. And there is. But our, our mission, our goal has to be the same. Our message has to be the same. We've got to reach the individual. We've got to reach the lost one person at a time. And that's what we see in verses 9 through 11. Peter and James, or John rather, they didn't come in and deal with the multitude. They dealt, dealt with this one person. You say, well, P uh, preacher, that didn't make much of an impact. Yes, it did. They reached that one person. And he got right with God. He got healed from God. That was a physical outward of, uh, change in this man. A reflection of the inward change that took place. He stood up and he leaped and he praised the Lord. And guess what it did? It brought everybody to them. The multitude came to them. I remember reading about preachers who would come into cities and before they would come in they would to have, have a revival service, they would contact the pastor of the church they were going to be at and they would say to that pastor, listen, I want you to talk to your people in your church and I want you all to figure out who it is in your town that is the most wicked, most ungodly, most hateful person in town and then I want you to start calling his name out before God. I want you to start praying that God will do a work and change that man. And I want you to pray and I want you to fast. And I want you to tell me who it is and I'm going to be praying for that man. Or for that woman. Or for that family. And I'm going to call their name out day by day. And they would begin to pray for weeks on end for just one person. One person in that town. And then whenever they would come to the church, the preacher would come in and they would invite him to come. Or invite her to come. Or they would go to him and they would talk to him. And guess what would happen? They would lead him to the Lord. And guess what else would happen? There would be such a change in the life of that person that the whole town would take notice. And the whole town would begin coming to church. The whole town would be changed because of one person. 
one person. I tell you, God Almighty can do that same thing today because there's power in the name of Jesus, alright? And if you and I would take it seriously and get down on our faces and start calling out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our lost loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers that need Jesus, if we would start praying for our community, for our city, for our county, if we would begin to pray for that, God would do something. So we see the multitude. We see the man. We see the multitude. I'm going to give you one more and I'm going to shut up. Amen. I want you to see the message. The message. Verses 12 through 26. I'm going to take a few minutes and read just some of these verses. Whenever the crowd gathered together. You see, Peter didn't walk in, ignore the crippled man, and walk into the temple and demand that people come hear him. He didn't walk in and say, hey, everybody, Peter's here. Gather around. Peter's here. Peter, former fisherman, come here. He didn't do that. He didn't even walk into the temple. He saw the man outside the temple that had a need. He met that need. The people came to him. Whenever they saw the change that was in this man's life, the people came to him. And when the people came and they were asking, what made this difference in this man? The Bible says Peter stands up at that point and says this. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why ye look so earnestly on us as though we, by our own power or holiness, we had made this man to walk? He said, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye deny the Holy One and the just, and desire a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his, and his name, through faith in His name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by Him hath given Him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as though as did also your rulers. I'm going to stop reading right there. We're going to look at some more of these verses in just a minute, but I wanted to give you the, the crux of Peter's message right there. What's going on here is this, is that the message hasn't changed. I want you to see that. The message in 2020 is the same as it was when Peter stood up outside the temple and preached. The message was the same. All right, The message has not changed. That is one area... One area that we cannot sacrifice in, regardless if we're dealing with one person or regardless if we're dealing with thousands or people we can't even number, the message must stay the same. They, uh, we've got to understand this. And Peter, let me sum it up for you what Peter's saying. He says, this didn't happen because we have power in ourselves. He said, this happened because there is power in the name of Jesus. He says, you know who Jesus is. You're the ones that stood up whenever Pilate was uh, ready to let him go and said, crucify him. Give us Barabbas instead. Now, you're the ones that did that. Now, I like what Peter says here. I like whenever Peter says this. He says, them, he says, now listen, I believe some of you did that ignorantly. Some of you did it because you didn't realize that Jesus was your Messiah. Some of you did it because the crowd was saying, crucify him, and you went along with the crowd. He said, I believe you did it ignorantly. You know, Jesus even said that when he's on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They didn't understand who he was. They didn't understand the, the uh, problem of what was taking place here. What am I getting at? I want you to understand this, that the crowd of people may have been present at the crucifixion, but they were, they were just going along with what the crowd did. Peter says, listen, Jesus of Nazareth, the man in whose name, uh, the man in whose name this man was healed, uh, he is the Messiah. You wanted him dead, but God said otherwise. God said, no, he'll die. He'll die for you, but he's coming back to prove that he can save you. God raised him from the dead. Why? To prove that he was and he is the Messiah. Look at verse number 26 here in, verse number, in chapter number 3. Look at verse number 26. Now, we're skipping a bunch of verses. I encourage you to read them on your own tonight. Verse number 26 says this, Unto you first, God having raised up His Son, Jesus sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from His iniquities. That's the crux of the gospel message right there. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, took your place so that you could be forgiven. 
Verse number 26 is the crux of our message today. Not that we have a dead God, but that we have a living Savior. You understand that? We have a living Savior. And whether we're dealing with just one person one-on-one, -on -one, or whether we're dealing with more people than we can count, it's the same message. Listen, here's the message. God loves you. That's good, isn't it? I like to remind myself every now and then that God loves me. You know, I look in the mirror, I see somebody that's unlovable, somebody that doesn't deserve the mercy, the love, the grace of God, none of that. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll say the same thing. I don't deserve God's love, but God loves me. I'm thankful for that. But let me tell you what else. God loves you. God wants you to be with Him. Now, that's great news right there. But guess what? You can't be with God. You say, I can't be with God even if He wants me to be with Him. That's right. You can't be with God even though He wants you to be with Him. Well, why can't I be with God? Because God is holy. Because God is perfect. Because God is righteous. And the Bible says that you and I, guess what we are? None of that. We're unrighteous. We're unholy. We're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us can get to God. But God loves me. God wants me to be with Him. That's right. That's the reason that the Bible also tells us that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's wonderful. So Jesus died on the cross. Perfect. What do I have to do to be saved? You can't do anything to be saved. It's not of works lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. So you mean that God loved me enough that He sent, He gave His only begotten Son, and I can't earn that salvation? That's right. So how do I be saved? Well, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's the good news. That's our message. That's what Peter is telling these Jews right here in Acts. Not in so many words, but that's what he's telling them. Listen. You all had Jesus crucified ignorantly. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love you. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. God loves you just like this crippled man. God loved him. Some of y'all would ignore him and walk past him. Some of y'all would give him a little bit of change. Some of you would give him a little bit more, but none of you care for him the way that God does. Jesus died for him and Jesus healed him. You can be healed too. You can be saved too because guess what? Jesus died for you. Let me tell you, church, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. Power to save, power to heal, power to forgive. And I'm thankful for this. There's power to forget. Amen? Aren't you glad that Jesus never once reminds you of a single thing you've done wrong? You might remind yourself. The devil might try to remind you of something you've done in the past, but Jesus never brings anything up. That's the mark of forgiveness, by the way. Never bringing it back up, all right? Today, let me tell you, right where you're at, right where you're sitting, either in your car, in your lawn chair, or at home on your couch, right where you're sitting, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can know Him today because He died for you. He took your place. He died in your place. And right now, right where you're at, if you will believe in your heart, understand, first of all, that you're a sinner and need a forgiveness, and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, Ask Him to forgive you. He will save you right now. Hey, listen, I want to encourage you. If you're here this morning listening to me, if you're for the first time, you're saying, listen, preacher, I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'll talk with you. I'll take as much time as is necessary. If you're listening on Facebook, if you, if you right now want to know more about how you can be saved, you send me a message, give me a phone call or something, and I will take the time to talk with you about how you can be saved. Listen, nothing greater, nothing greater in the world than knowing your sins are forgiven and that you have a home in heaven. Amen. Let's bow.